What an honor to be speaking to you today as we launch into the 2021 Zero Project Conference. The Zero Project not only has a mission of working towards a world without barriers, but it is able to bring together an amazing collection of speakers, researchers, and participants to a place, in this case, a virtual space, that is centered on advancing the tenets and the spirit of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. I'm excited that this year's focus areas for the conference are employment and ICT. These increasingly intersecting sectors have never been more relevant. The pandemic has necessitated us to make shifts in the way we engage and stay connected with friends, family and colleagues. It has us all pondering how we work now and what the future of work will look like. And it has perhaps most importantly uncovered the stark inequalities that exist in terms of who has access to ICT and employment and who does not. We can all agree that this past year has been unlike any we've ever experienced before. Last year, I was at the Zero Conference in the beautiful city of Vienna. This year, I'm working from my home in Washington, DC. And while I wish I were with all of you together, learning face to face, and I must confess, I do look forward to that day when it is possible again. The pandemic has made clear that there are many opportunities for us to seize upon in order to be more inclusive of everybody. But it has also exposed the deep fault lines and the sobering reality that far too many persons with disabilities remain excluded from the response and recovery efforts brought on by the pandemic. And so while we gather on our screens to celebrate the achievements that have been made on disability inclusion, this time it behooves us to be candid and honest about the long way ahead and recognize more than ever before that we need each other to achieve sustainable and resilient disability inclusion. We want to ensure that labor markets empowers persons with disabilities to participate fully and in turn contribute to building stronger societies and more robust economies. Inclusive employment is one of the most effective ways to promote empowerment, participation, and social inclusion for persons with disabilities. As we continue this journey towards inclusive disability inclusion, I'm reminded by one of my favorite African proverbs. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And despite our need to maintain social distance to protect one another right now, it is crucial for us to forge ahead together. In a year where so many of us have benefited from various technologies that have allowed us to stay connected to the people we love and continue with our work and education from remote locations, we must also remain concerned by the fact that there are many persons with disabilities, especially in low and middle income countries who face barriers, including the availability, affordability, adaptability, and accessibility, and will be further left behind if not prioritized. Technology has the power to break traditional barriers that persons with disabilities might face by providing flexibility, the choice, and the agency to engage with their work, their peers, their environment in ways that fits them best. But it can also deepen the divide between those that have access to, to the opportunities of technology and, and those that don't. Harnessing technology in a way that ensures equity, access, and affordability and appropriateness for persons with, with disabilities requires a broader systems approach. We need to guide technological development in such a way that the wins that we have made are sustained, resilient, scalable, and enhanced. Article 27 of the CRPD recognizes the rights of persons with disabilities 
to work and to the opportunity of gaining a living and, and living in an open, inclusive and accessible labor market. The CRPD unequivocally prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in all forms of employment through the employment cycle, which requires employees to be trained on what an inclusive workplace looks like and what reasonable accommodations are necessary to support employment. We know that even before COVID-19, many persons with disabilities were advocating for work from home options reasonable accommodations, and flexible schedules. And in many instances, these requests were either denied or unmet. What COVID-19 has exposed is that these accommodations and practices that millions of working people across the world are benefiting from today because of the pandemic should not be denied to those who might need them after the pandemic. No one should be turned away from a job because they require these accommodations because we now know they work. At the World Bank, including persons with disabilities and expanding equ equitable opportunities are at the core of our work to build sustainable and inclusive communities aligned with, our, with the institution's twin goals of ending extreme poverty and promoting shared prosperity. Disability is a cross-cutting theme in both our environmental social framework and in the International Development Association's 2019 financing package, which is essentially a fund for the world's poorest countries. Each of these instruments present a unique opportunities to ensure the systematic inclusion of persons with disabilities in World Bank projects, as well as supports the services provided by governments who receive funding. Under the IDA-19 funding stream on jobs and economic transformation, there are policy commitments with explicit reference to ensuring the inclusion of persons with disabilities in entrepreneurship, skills development, and economic transformation. The World Bank recognizes that the employment rates of persons with disabilities are lower than the rates of persons without disabilities. They earn less, they're more likely to be in low-skilled part-time and informal job settings, and often with sub-minimum wages. They face challenges in accessing financing, markets, and networks because of the barriers that result from non-inclusive regulations, policies, and resource allocations, but also because of social stigma and prejudice and often low education participation. And while these challenges are many, I want to take a moment to highlight some of the, the work that the World Bank has supported in a few of our client countries to help close these gaps. In Jamaica, we have supported employment skill training of 336 adults with disability, 77% of who are now employed and or are pursuing advanced training in areas such as office administration, data operations, and customer service. We know that this is not only the right thing to do, but we hope that by increasing the number of persons with disabilities actively participating in the workplace, that we are working towards implementing the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and that we are normalizing disability inclusion, and in so doing, diffusing prejudice, stigma, and discrimination based on disability. As a member of the Innovation to Inclusion Consortium, a third, a three-year Leonard Cheshire program that aims to improve access to employment in the private sector for persons with disabilities, the World Bank is providing new analysis and technical assistance to government partners in Bangladesh and, and Kenya on accelerating digital inclusion and digital skills for the labor market of the future. The program will also explore how social protection systems can better enable employees with disabilities to cover additional costs of working and how we can collect better and more robust disability data. We know that the use of accessible ICT in most sectors 
will contribute to a more inclusive ecosystem that is critical for persons with disabilities to obtain skills, development, jobs, and be better placed where possible to contribute to society. And so again, while this pandemic has created great challenges for everyone, it is imperative that we dare ourselves to be more creative and bolder with our solutions, more accessible in our designs, more mindful of everyone's individual uniqueness, and more inclusive as we envisage our, fut our future, a future for all. At the World Bank, we have set internal commitments to ensure that more of our projects are disability inclusive. We are training more staff on how to operationalize disability inclusion. We are also shoring up the data and the analytics that, that are essential for influencing what we design, how we prioritize our resources, what actions we take, and what gaps remain. And so this event presents an amazing opportunity for us to listen and learn from all of you on the progress that you're making in these on these issues. As we delve into the in, as we delve into these critical conversations over the next three days, I have three challenges I'd like to close with. The first challenge is to recognize the constraints around technology, particularly when it inadvertently increases cha uh, challenges and widens the digital gap. And instead, we should focus on supporting innovations that ensure that all will benefit and that no one will be left behind. The second challenge is to move beyond the often isolated training and skills development of persons with disabilities to be equipped and ready for employment, but to engage with employers to create more inclusive work environments for all of the employees and to provide any reasonable accommodations that would allow a person with a disability to participate fully in their role. In so doing, remember, involving persons with disabilities in this dialogue is critical. It is so much more impactful and just to have persons with disabilities empowered to drive the changes needed from employers and within the work environment. The third challenge is to not let this health, economic and inequality pandemic stymie progress, but rather to use it as a catalyst for our work collectively. Let us leverage the lessons learned from this pandemic to ensure more persons with disabilities are employed and use them even when they come out on the other side because inevitably there will be future crises and we should be better prepared to approach them more swiftly and inclusively and ensure that no one is left behind. Thank you for including me in this incredibly critical discussion. I look forward to listening to all that there is to learn from you over the next few days and going forward together. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you for this energizing speech, as always, and we are really glad that you're here with us uh, today. Hello, Charlotte. Hi, Michael. Wonderful to see you. Unfortunately, I'm not in your beautiful city, but um, still good to see you. Yeah, so next year is a different year. We will definitely try to bring you to Vienna again. Uh, Charlotte, my, my question uh, first um, is, uh, um, I'm listening to uh, and I'm fo following, of course, the, uh, the programs of the, of the World Bank for many years and congratulations also for the progress uh, that you're also personally making for, uh, for uh, making the programs and, uh, and the instruments more inclusive. My question would be also looking at the, at the audience that we have here uh, with us today and in those three days, uh, what would be your advice to engage with the World Bank? These are fascinating projects. Who are, who are you looking for as partners? Uh, who, who, who might you also be missing? Who would you encourage to come forward uh, to, to get connected? Because you need these people to roll out your programs and your uh, instruments. Thanks, Michael, for, for an excellent question. Um, and I think it goes to the essence of my, of my keynote. And that is, you know, we have to do this together. Um, and I think what we would be looking for in terms of partnership are, um, you know, 
very strong technical abilities, people who understand and who can direct us on how to make how to make things work. Be a bit more concrete. I mean, we all are talking about uh, inclusive employment, but we really need to have good examples uh, that can be put in place and that can be scaled. So it's really about understanding how these systems work and how we can take them to scale. So that would be an important call for me. I think having strong analysis, so people who are doing solid research, robust research on both uh, the impact of technology on persons with disabilities and, uh, and um, employment also are the types of partners that we're looking for. And we're also looking for partners uh, that can help us understand some of the really um, grassroots needs in the particular in the particular context in which we work, mm -hmm. because we in some ways are a bit um, removed from that. So really, having a sense of what are some of the key issues is important for us to to consider. Um, I do believe that having a multidisciplinary approach to addressing some of these issues is really important. And so I would encourage those of you that are listening in on this. Um, if you have something to offer, we would be interested in talking to you about how that might work for us. Uh, thank you so much, Charlotte. This was really uh, helpful and enlightening. Um, I would like now to bring in uh, Joy, Joy Morozov, who joins me here in the studio uh, today. Uh, Joy is a renowned uh, expert in, um, in uh, inclusive development uh, policies and, and practical work on the ground, being with Light for the World now for several years. Uh, Joy, can you give us a more uh, in-depth introduction of yourself? Sure. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Glad to be with the Zero Project this year uh, again. Um, so I've been, um, prior to Light for the World, I was working in the private sector. And uh, in 2015, I joined uh, Light for the World and uh, got myself to understand what international development is about and what is uh, sustainability about. So my work at Light for the World has been to uh, forge partnerships uh, to uh, enable uh, and break barriers uh, for people with disabilities who live in sub-Saharan Africa through uh, programs in inclusive education, economic empowerment, and disability inclusion in uh, um, community development. So this is what I've been doing for the last uh, five years. Fantastic journey, been to Burkina Faso, been to uh, Ethiopia, and really seen how these projects work on the ground. Great. So uh, we both uh, watched now Charlotte's speech. What were your main takeaways and what would be even a question to Charlotte uh, that you would want to ask her right, right now? Fantastic. Um, so in terms of uh, my takeaways is the fact that you create the data, which is a very important uh, piece of work that we always use, third party evidence, when we are talking to partners to, under, to explain to them why is it that we need to, uh, for example, do a particular program in inclusive education. And I've seen uh, that you are, you've pledged that by 2025, you, uh, the education programs of uh, the World Bank uh, will be disability inclusive, which is fantastic. Uh, so for us, what you are doing in, this, in the world of the, the ecosystem is bringing robust data to explain and educate uh, our uh, partners. Uh, what question I have for you is um, how can we make the dialogue stronger between the World Bank and you are a actual a role model. How can you make, make your voice even stronger and amplified to the civil society like us who are working in many countries? Oh, shall I continue? Charlotte? Okay. Um, well, um, it, um, I'm going to, to continue and uh, share my thoughts uh, until we have uh, Charlotte back here. Um, so I was uh, especially interested in, uh, and maybe also, uh, Joe, you want me to, to come in here as well. Uh, you mentioned this, this digital gap, uh, and of course, this is an enormous uh, topic from my point of view. 
many people in, uh, making, this, making uh, important decisions would not be really knowledgeable of what this actually means, avoiding the digital gap, uh, what this means, creating inclusive uh, uh, tools and creating inclusive technology. Uh, um, I know that uh, there's a big project, for example, from uh, Light for the World in Burkina Faso that's about uh, digital inclusion, in this case, in employment. Um, what, are you t what, what would you be your advice on, on how to look at this and how to avoid in practice uh, those, uh, those pitfalls of creating new gaps? So when you're looking at uh, technology, okay, you can't just say, let's roll it out and make it happen. You, you have to look at it from the perspective of how, how do you bring it to the people who are in the most remote of villages? How do you reach, how do you reach them? When in some cases, the internet is not available, uh, people don't have access uh, uh, to computers, and also uh, you have to adapt it uh, from the perspective of people's uh, ability to use the technology, access to technology, and acceptance of uh, technology because some people have a mental block. I don't want to, I don't want to use it. And I would much rather uh, live like me, feeling you know, excluded and being, being scared, because that way I know that I'm, nobody's expecting anything from me. So there's a lot of attitudinal change that you'll have to look at in, in taking on uh, uh, technology. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also a lot on, um, on, on this whole chain, this value chain of creating uh, those uh, uh, those, those fully inclusive and accessible technology. Talking about remote areas, I think it starts with maybe solar energy, you know, because you don't have electricity, you don't have uh, uh, other energy sources, so creating something uh, fully in inclusive means you have to have energy there, so this, you have to think really in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the broad sense of, uh, of creating technology from, uh, from the ground. You know? Absolutely, and you notice actually that what you're doing impacts the others. Um, so, for example, as you mentioned, is the energy there? Uh, are the people accepting it? How can you use it at home? So all of the different things that you need to think through in order to actually bring it and roll it out on, on, uh, uh, and put it in the hands of people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, another point that uh, Charlotte mentioned in, in the three um, action points that she mentioned at the, at the end of her speech was uh, also supporting entrepreneurship. Huh? I think entrepreneurship, we all know this is, um, uh, this is something extremely important, but um, I think there's um, uh, a wider gap between supporting entrepreneurship for being people in remote areas, making themselves uh, independent, making themselves entrepreneurs, is even bigger than creating some structures that support people with disabilities in, let's say, uh, waged employment. No? Would you agree or would you say this is... Um, from your experience, uh, it's the same uh, effort. Um, how would you seek supporting entrepreneurship, what's needed uh, in, uh, in low developed countries? Absolutely. So when you look at it from the perspective of um, what is on the ground, and you want to uh, reach people with disabilities, what you don't want to do is create a parallel system. You have to really look at what are the, which training centers are out there. Um, how do you train them up to, uh, uh, take in people with disabilities because what we don't want to do and that's the great thing about the zero project is you know bring down every single barrier and not create parallel systems so you're looking at who are the providers of um, skilling up people with disabilities training them up explaining to them how how it how it works and then uh, making sure that you are recruiting people with disabilities then you have to start from the education because if you catch them at the age of 16, 17, and it's too late, you, really ha um, you have to really start from the primary school education. So how do you, how do you make the education uh, inclusive as well? So then you're really working with the different stakeholders from the very start. And the stakeholders are actually the parent. If the mom who, is, who has the child with disability at home does not want this child to go to school or does not want this child to go to you know, be trained up uh, to do vocational training, mm -hmm. then you've, you've lost the battle. So there's a lot of psychology work that needs to be done by the people who are in the field and knocking on and finding a lot of them, as we all know, in Burkina Faso and in countries in sub-Saharan Africa, is they're hidden. Mm -hmm. So you've got to take them out and work at many, many levels. Okay. 
Okay, Charlotte, you're, you're back. Uh, uh, we uh, currently analyzed your speech and uh, especially the three action points that you mentioned at the, at the end. So uh, we got some two more minutes. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on uh, how to avoid the digital gap? That was for your first one. The second one uh, was on not creating those, uh, uh, those uh, different uh, specialized uh, training and, and, and vocational training uh, systems for um, in, in, in vocational training for people with disabilities that are completely separated uh, from the rest. Uh, so could you elaborate a little on, on, uh, on uh, what this would mean also for your work, what, what will actually be done in, in these three uh, action points? Well, thank you very much, Michael, and I'm not sure what happened, uh, but I was kicked don't, off. Don't worry, yeah. Just to say that in terms of looking at access to um, accessible ICT, we really need to look at how uh, we need to make sure that um, broadband, broadband is more available uh, to countries. And, and that's a really important piece because that f forms the, the foundation of how people can then actually use the Internet and a, and a lot of other um, aspects around that. So I think there's a really there's a big push to look at how do we look at bringing down the cost, uh, because the cost is actually quite prohibitive. The other thing to look at is devices. When we use, when we look at the types of devices that are used in many uh, sub-Saharan countries and South Asian countries, you still have the old flip phones, right? And many of those don't have the accessibility features built into them. So we need to ensure that devices are have um, accessibility features built into them. We need to upskill and train people on how to use devices and use um, the internet. Um, I think that that's a really important piece going forward, given the fact that the future of work really is going to be a, a digital future. We need to ensure that young persons with disabilities are learning how to, to be part of this, this new economy. So I think for me, that's an important piece, making sure that um, there is the demand side as well as the supply side in place um, if we're going to close that digital gap. And I think there's also a call in, in that to require uh, those that make these, uh, the products, that they too uh, consider aspects of, of, dis of accessibility from the get-go. Uh, and herein, there's a really important role for the private sector um, and the creators of these types of devices and tools to ensure that they are, in fact, accessible. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we're trying to do at the bank is to, as I said, is to really build the knowledge base, uh, provide the analytics around what works, um, explore and have deep analyses of how vocational training is working. Does this work? Are there pathways from vocational training into the actual form, formal employment? So some of those are research areas that we would like to explore um, in, in, in months to come. Charlotte, thank you so much. Uh, it was uh, wonderful, as always, uh, having you with you, although this time only virtually. Uh, many things that you said also reflect to our, the next year of the Zero Project, will, which will be again be on accessibility with a focus on ICT. So I'm really happy that we can uh, hopefully um, work together closely in the, in, in the coming year. Thanks so much, Charlotte. Um, I'm Thank moving you, on Michael. now. Thank you. Um, Charlotte, I'm, um, thanks again. I'm now moving on to, the, to our next uh, keynote speech, uh, which is uh, Sophia Korac. Sophia is Senior Human Rights and Health Advisor at the United States Missions to the United Nations uh, in New York. So we hear first uh, the keynote speech of Sophia, and then we have again a live discussion with her. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sofia Kodic and I'm very honored to be speaking here to you all today and wanted to thank the Zero Project for inviting me here. This year's conference theme, focusing on employment, is particularly relevant as countries around the globe face the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, challenges that always most disproportionately impact persons with disabilities. Many have lost their jobs, livelihood, access to healthcare, and are struggling to provide for their families. Article 27 of the CRPD provides all the protections and provisions to ensure persons with disabilities have employment opportunities and are able to do their jobs on an equal basis with others. This includes important concepts like reasonable accommodations. In my own country, the Americans with Disabilities Act outlines these protections in a very concrete way, including defining reasonable accommodations. 
However, while the laws may exist in the books and more than 160 countries have ratified the CRPD, this is often not enough. And persons with disabilities still face many barriers and discrimination in employment, particularly in fields with, where they have been traditionally underrepresented. I wanted to start off with a brief anecdote from an earlier part of my career. An immigrant and a person with disability whose family moved from Belgrade, Serbia to the US when I was young, I returned to Serbia and the Balkans and started my career working on the ground, first with civil society and then the UN to advance the rights of persons with disabilities and implement the CRPD. Employment and education were the two main focuses for the Serbian government during this time, having just passed the first national level non-discrimination law related to persons with disabilities. As I traveled around Serbia and the broader region, I was struck by how persons with disabilities in each country seemed to gravitate towards one or two professions. In Serbia, many finished law. In Montenegro, every single person with a disability I met studied marketing or computer science. Very puzzled, I asked a Montenegrin colleague and head of a DPO who became a close friend why this was the case. Oh, it's simple, he said. Here, the only faculty accessible to wheelchair users is one where marketing or informatics or computer science are studied. I didn't know what to say, to be honest. To be limited by what you do in life due to physical barriers was appalling to me at the time, having had the opportunity to grow up in the US and study and pursue any career I wanted. To me, it was especially unfathomable um, what my friend in Montenegro said because I was terrible at math and couldn't imagine pursuing any kind of career that involved math. Uh, while this is an extreme example, accessibility does and did play a factor in choosing higher education for many of my peers, even here in the United States. I grew up doing adaptive sports, including wheelchair basketball, and about 90% of my friends from sports went to universities with wheelchair basketball or track teams, which were also the most accessible schools. Many stayed in the coaching field because it was what most persons with disabilities before them did. Years later, some have expressed regretting not pursuing their passion outside of sports. At the time, I was only a handful of peers to study what I uh, chose to do outside of sports. I was one of only three of my group of friends, uh, st stubborn enough to go to the university, the one university that told me, don't come here, we aren't accessible at all. What can I say? I like challenges. This example brings about a very important distinction. It is not only essential to have persons with disabilities attend school and pursue jobs on an equal basis with others, but to have the support and affirmation to pick the studies and jobs they actually want to do. This is a luxury many take for granted with and without disabilities. Similarly, as I've learned through my work with the UN, civil society, and now the US mission to the UN over the last decade, the, Default perception is that persons with disabilities work only on disability issues, attend disability specific conferences, and don't do anything outside of these areas in their career choices. My current job, pre-COVID, had me running back and forth between the US mission and complicated labyrinth that is the UN headquarters conference rooms in New York. As a senior human rights advisor, I cover a range of issues that require me to attend very different meetings, negotiations, and side events often back-to-back -back in completely different parts of the UN building. Even after more than three years here, whenever I'm in the building, I have at least one encounter a week from a UN security guard or a visitor asking me something along the lines of, are you lost? Is there a disability conference that way? Oh, where are you going? The UN tours are that way. When I come up to the accessible entry gate to swipe my blue badge, just like all of my other colleagues without disabilities do every single day, I am often scolded for not letting the security guard open a gate for me on the other side, away from where all the rest of the staff entered. I met with confusion, surprise, and sometimes even disdain for opening my own gate and going about my day like everybody else, disability or no disability. This type of attitudinal challenge has permeated all of my work with the US mission related to disability. My delegation sits on two groups that play a critical role for advancing accessibility and mainstreaming a disability perspective into the UN's work, a group of friends on persons with disabilities and an accessibility steering committee. We have accomplished a lot over the last years, but have a long way to go. The accessibility steering committee chaired by the delegations of Republic of Korea and Antigua and Barbuda have enabled UN member states to challenge physical and, dis and digital accessibility from a firsthand perspective. With myself, a wheelchair user on the committee, and the permanent representative from Antigua and Barbuda, who has a visual impairment, 
At the helm, we have turned the UN's rules and procedures upside down to increase access. We have pushed for a vision in the General Assembly annual resolution on revitalizing the work of the General Assembly to ensure member state seats in formal UN conferences, whether in the GA Hall or another conference room, are accessible for all delegates. If a delegation's alphabetical placement is in an inaccessible seat, of which unfortunately there are many, um, even after the big renovation that the UN underwent, the UN Secretariat is obligated to move them to the closest accessible seat and remain there at the start of the conference. This seems like an easy fix, but it only happened after almost two years of countless um, conversations behind closed doors and with the, across the UN, um, where I, had, I was fortunate enough to have the support of my ambassador and my mission. Uh, this all came about from my personal experience of our delegation being up the stairs and myself not being able to support our ambassador uh, for remarks that she was delivering that I had written uh, due to the fact that I couldn't get up the stairs and sit behind her. The worst experience before we made this change was coordinating a 30-person delegation from Capitol, and I had to be back and forth from our seat, uh, but couldn't actually get to any of my colleagues because they were up the stairs. As we began this, this endeavor, the, lar the biggest challenge was explaining to UN Secretariat staff that I didn't only need the seat when I was physically in it, but I also needed to have access to my high level participants and the whole delegation. Uh, the ambassador I mentioned before also had a similarly challenging experience ensuring that he had access to a braille label to be placed over the voting buttons in the General Assembly so he could vote on resolutions along with his peers without disabilities. It, in my opinion, took way too long to explain that it was not enough to have his staff vote for him, um, but that he should be able to vote along with the other permanent representatives himself. Similarly, we're working on several projects now to increase accessibility. Uh, the U.S. mission has led working with our protocol team to make a uniform accessible registration form for UN meetings and conferences that can be applied to all meetings and all types of attendees, whether those are persons with disabilities who are member states, civil society, those based in New York, or those attending a conference from Capitol. We learned through our engagement at the UN uh, we learned through our engagement the UN was only paying attention to accessibility for the annual CRPD Conference of States parties, and frankly, still not doing a 100% perfect job, to be honest. This is a very important and critical conference, and many of us here attend it, uh, but it's not the only time persons with disabilities are represented at the UN. Rather than a cumbersome registration process, we learned that the UN system in Geneva was using, which asked very detailed and somewhat unnecessarily prying questions, we are working on developing a form that is simple, focuses on reasonable accommodation, and leaves room for write-in options because, as we all know, reasonable accommodations vary from person to person, even those that have the same type of disability. The hard work now falls on UN colleagues to coordinate different parts of the UN system to make the form a reality and to actually be implemented across meetings. I'm also really proud of two other initiatives we are working on, both also based on accessibility challenge I and other colleagues faced. Uh, my work, as I've mentioned, is often uh, very hectic and sometimes even involves staying after hours at the UN, sometimes even as late as six in the morning. I don't know how I do it. I always seem to get some of the most controversial meetings. Um, often, as I mentioned, during our busy season, we're there until at least one or two in the morning, sometimes even through the night. Um, I learned very quickly that the only way out of the building after 9 p.m. is through an inaccessible turnstile where my wheelchair does not fit. My options were wait for them to find a security guard after hours, which in my experience took anywhere from one to three hours after the meeting ended, which then you know would become 4 a.m. if we were leaving at 1 a.m., et cetera, or to exit where the cars go. So after several evenings of waiting for hours, one time even waiting two hours for a guard to bring a key on a key ring of 30 keys, yes, the traditional keys in an era where most locks are digital, and then proceed to go through them one by one, and unfortunately, the last key was the proper one. Um, I realized that changes had to be made. I had the full support of my mission. And during this particular conference, uh, we talked to UN security and they were able to have a guard ready when the meeting ended. But this only lasted about one or two days before referring back to the similar process I mentioned.
After many months, the UN has finally started working on a wider gate that I can exit after hours that'll be right next to the turnstile that my peers without disabilities use. Uh, the gate will be rolled out hopefully in the coming months, which is very exciting. Covering a wide range of human rights issues in my current job and throughout my career, I'm always bringing the word inter intersectionality to the table. While each of our experiences are different, different types of disabilities, different cultures, backgrounds, even different experiences by individuals with the same disability, we all face common barriers and challenges, often from a lack of understanding. We can overcome these barriers more effectively when we work together and work with allies who have maybe not the exact experience, but experiences they can bring to the table. Finally, I wanted to quickly return to the idea about persons with disabilities often being stuck in certain somewhat predetermined career paths. I've been super happy to see a number of Americans with disabilities make headlines in the last few years, although for many of these jobs, it should have been earlier. For example, the first Tony winner and wheelchair user on Broadway, uh, more persons with disabilities I've met directly or indirectly in the healthcare field. Uh, I met a wheelchair user through a friend who is a nurse in New York City and has been at the front line of the COVID crisis. I asked her how she navigated the already challenging environment in her chair, and she said the toughest part was both patients and doctors alike not believing she was qualified to care for them just because she did it sitting down. This to me shows we have a long way to go. We may have the CRPD and, and national level laws in each of our countries on the books, and in many cases they may be implemented quite well, but laws don't inherently change attitudes. I hope that in my lifetime I see a world where persons with disabilities are role models in all fields of work and truly believe in and pursue any studies and job they want. This to me would be true mainstreaming and inclusion. Thank you so much again for having me today. Thank you so much, Sophia, for this uh, great speech, your personal words, and also uh, making uh, the challenges and obstacles so, so tangible and clear uh, to us. Hello, Sophia. Hi, Michael. Uh, thank you so much. And it's great to be here, uh, although I, I also wish I was there in person, but hopefully in a future year. Um, Sophia, um, I would like to um, to a broad discussion a little on, um, uh, before going into details, but uh, where do you see what is the big obstacle, what is the big barrier that so many big organizations, UN organizations, UN agencies, but also governments, um, also private sector, large organizations, it's so difficult to change, it's so difficult to create more inclusion, it's so difficult to, more, to create more accessibility. There's no obvious con, con to that. No? So, you have many discussions, there's a pro and a con, and this is an open field where this, this uh, discussion goes back and forth. But what have you identified as the major barrier that so little change is happening, and what, you, what, what is your personal approach to, to overcome uh, those, uh, those obstacles? What do you do, and I know you're a, you're a fighter for more inclusion and accessibility. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. Um, I think we could speak for days on, on all the different challenges, but I think um, to me, the main challenge I have seen uh, it is kind of the core of the speech I just gave, uh, which is attitudinal challenges. And I think um, also thinking of persons with disabilities, as I mentioned, in uh, more traditional roles where they are working on disability inclusion and uh, not you know, in my experience there, I think I am one of a handful of diplomats that I, I have encountered um, who has a visible disability. And, and the fact that we have two organizations uh, that we're sitting on with over uh, 30 member states in, in each, and that only uh, myself and, and the ambassador from Antigua and Barbuda have uh, disabilities uh, from the membership is, is very telling. I, I think um, it's, you know, everybody on the surface wants to be helpful and, and wants to make, including the United Nations um, and big organizations, disability inclusion key to their efforts. But I gave some of the specific examples because I think the, uh, the attitudinal changes are, are very slow to come. And I think it takes, it, it will take more people like myself um, and the ambassador and, and many others to really show both people with disabilities that they can be in these pa career paths, but also to show that no, we are not. We are working on disability issues, but there's also different types of jobs, even at the UN daily, whether you're a member state or a civil society member or a UN staffer um, that you are working on, or maybe even, you know, an engineer or 
uh, interpreter, so uh, and you happen to have a disability, but that's not at, at the core of your work. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sophia. So I would like to bring in now uh, Gabi, Gabi Admon Rick. Uh, he works for the Israeli government, for the Ministry of Justice. Of course, it's not a UN agency, it's a government, but uh, you might have similar issues or is it not? So uh, could, you, could you tell us a little bit of, you, we watched this together now, the speech of Sophia, where you, do you see similarities in the issues and the problems, where are differences, and maybe you start by, by introducing yourself a little and then, uh, then uh, yeah, get, go a little more into details about what, what where you take away, where you see similar things, where you see differences, and what's your approach to uh, move uh, society and governments towards more accessibility and, and inclusion. Um, Gabi, we cannot hear you. You have to unmute. Yeah, Hi. No, it, no, it so I'm really happy to be here and be part of this discussion. And thank you for inviting me and being in Zero Project. And I'm really, I wish I could be in Vienna with you guys, uh, maybe next year. So I'll just introduce myself. I'm from the Commission of Equal Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And um, we are part of the Israeli Ministry of Justice. Um, and we are responsible for implementing the Equal Rights of Persons with Disabilities Law and uh, promoting the CRPD and monitoring. And uh, it's, it was very interesting for me to hear both uh, Charlotte and Sophia uh, talk about the work and the achievements and all the, um, and all the obstacles and still the challenges to make changes here uh, in New York, in the World Bank, globally. And we, we encounter very, very similar things in Israel. Um, I think uh, I wanted to talk, um, one thing that Charlotte talked about was the, the issue of the, the ICT and the digital barriers and gaps. And uh, I wanted to give one um, encouraging statistic that we found, that people under the age of 35 are um, almost the same in their digital use, use of the internet uh, as the other people without disabilities. So maybe the, uh, the gap is closing in the younger ages, people are using technologies more. And in the old ages, maybe that's where we have to put uh, in our um, lot of uh, efforts to make to close those gaps and allow people to use technology. Um, and regarding making uh, governments more accessible and more inclusive, I think that you talked about both of those ways. So the one way is the um, raising awareness. And I wanted to show you here a campaign that we did because we work a lot on awareness raising. And we made this beautiful campaign about open, the, it's, we call it open the door. So um, every person can be a person that opens the door. We'll put a link on the chat here so that you can uh, see it. But the, it's very important to change attitudes. The attitudinal barriers are so uh, important. Like, like uh, Sophia was saying, it's it's really um, it's really a barrier. And, and technology, ICTs, everything can't change that. You have to make um, you have to change and make awareness. And we noticed it in the COVID. Um, people with disabilities were left behind. Suddenly, we noticed that people with disabilities, the policies and everything didn't take into account people with disabilities, even um, apps and things that were probably would have been made accessible in regular days suddenly weren't. We had to work really hard to make everything in line with the requirements. So it's, it's, it is a challenge, and that I think also came out of Charlotte's words. And the other side is, of course, uh, legislate legislating powerful legislation um, we have for example a, our equal uh, rights for people with disabilities law and for example we have detailed regulation requirement about accessibility of services and it requires defines that technologies uh, have to be provided in certain uh, services and also where uh, we it, it talks about the uh, requirements on the internet sites and apps and uh, we can enforce these regulations. And I think it's really important to have bodies in uh, different countries and the global level that can enforce this and check that it's really implemented so that people, these barriers will be uh, eventually removed. Um, and um, and so this is, uh, this is also part of the government. Mm -hmm. um, 
Gabi, thank you. I'm, I'm yes. sorry I have, to, I, have to, I have to interrupt. It was extremely interesting listening to you, but we got an, uh, an interesting uh, questions from the, from the chat as well to Sophia, which I would like to, to end this session with. Uh, uh, Sophia, the question was, could you give us a, a very brief update on the UN disability inclusion strategy? You got some 90 seconds to answer this complex question. <laughs> So the UN Disability Inclusion um, Strategy and an update on that. Where, where are we and where can people maybe inform themselves about the progress? Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. Um, so the first report of the Disability Inclusion Strategy uh, was issued last fall. Uh, I believe it's now public, so I'm happy to share after if you want to share with our guests uh, the link to that. Um, and then we, uh, so it, as uh, many probably know, this is the, on the UN side, um, how the UN is, is becoming more uh, disability inclusive, both in its programming, its hiring, and um, in its physical accessibility. And so on, on the member state side, um, we are really trying to push it uh, in all of the, the resolutions and, and the documents that we negotiate to really draw attention because we think the, the indicators are really uh, the most cross-cutting uh, that we've seen uh, in, in this space. Um, so the report, not, not surprisingly, I, I would say in, in summary is, you know, it highlights some of the progress, but as Charlotte said as well in, in her keynote, um, we also have to recognize and be realistic that we have a long way to go. So from my perspective, I think the, the initial report is a good starting benchmark um, to show us where um, the gaps and the challenges are in a very concrete way. I, I also think uh, based on uh, the data that we've seen so far as well, it's it's a bit uh, based on self-reporting at the moment. So um, we will, you know, some some posts and, and uh, UN missions um, have given detailed data, others um, it's not as detailed, and then many have not provided data yet. And so um, we look forward to the ongoing discussions with the UN and, and hope that um, more uh, country teams and missions will provide data as well. And, and I think also the, the biggest challenge um, in the implementation of the report will also be the, the twin track approach of looking at um, the disability specific uh, programs, but then also really integrating it across the UN's work, whether in the peace and security, human rights or development agenda. Thank you so much, Sophia. With these kind of discussions, uh, they are so so great and motivating. It's it's, it's uh, almost everything is only an appetizer. It's not even maybe something like the greeting from the kitchen. But still, we have to close this uh, because of the timing. Thanks, Sophia. Thanks, Charlotte. Thanks, Gabi. Thanks, Joe, for for joining in. And with this, I'm closing the session. Thank you.